I, I love doing these. I, I was talking to one of the other speakers. I think this is like my 10th DevOps days this year. Um, love the format. Love the, the thought leaders coming up and, and sharing their ideas. Uh, some great talks this morning as well. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Long time engineer, 25 years a software developer. Uh, I'm in my 12th year as a security practitioner as well. So one of the great things about what I do now is I can speak at software conferences because I know a lot about writing software. And now I can speak a lot at security conferences explaining to them about developers. Uh, done a lot of stuff not only in my career but at Veracode specifically. So moved from Waterfall through to Agile and into DevOps. Did monolith to microservice trans transformations as well. Uh, I love whiskey, so if there's some great Singapore whiskeys, I'd love to hear about it and tell me where to drink them because I only got one night in Singapore and that's tonight. So there's no tomorrow for me. <laughs> <laughs> At least not here, not this time. Uh, this is how long I've been doing web application development. Does anyone remember the days when you had to pay for your browsers? I can see a lot of young faces out there like, what, what, what's that? Shrink wrapped on floppy disk. First day of my job, I show up and there's Microsoft Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator in a box. Crazy. Yeah, so I, I've been doing web application development since the mid-90s. Shipped my first one in 96. This was an intranet application, but it was web-based, so it was running on IIS, etc. So know a lot about that space as well. So this is the fun thing. So I, I created this slide while people were talking because it, it's interesting. I was thinking about the story of when this talk came to me. And if you see way over there in San Francisco, the little home icon. At RSA this year, in February, I said, I got this really cool idea. I'm looking at the landscape, looking at how development gets done. And I see this shift happening. And I want to tell people about it. And it's funny, you so said the cheesy name. We were tr I was trying to come up with a name for it. I couldn't think of a good name for it. Uh, now, fortunately, I've had the uh, excellent fortune of speaking about this in many different locations. I premiered this at DevOps Days Stockholm. I've given it in both an Ignite format and in a long form format. So I've kind of worked both sides of that. When, I, when Stockholm came back to me, I initially submitted it as an Ignite. They're like, hey, this is really interesting. Can you do it as a long form? I'm like, yes, I can. Uh, so I've, I've been able to travel the world talking not only about this, but other uh, topics as well. And you're going to hear Ignite from me till later today. But like I said, interesting story. So I want to be very, very clear, because you see a lot of definitions around DevOps, right? And what a DevOps team is. So usually, when I talk to companies that are just starting on the journey, this is what they mean. It's the people that do the tooling. It's the people that uh, you know, write the automation and the guys that do the operations. It's the ops side and maybe some you know, fancy automation side, right? What I mean when I say DevOps team, and that really needs to be clear because it's pertinent to this talk, they are responsible for everything, soup to nuts, cradle to grave, for everything that that team does. And the reason that we do this is because we want our developers to learn to write better software by operating the software. You will think differently if you get woken up a couple times at 2 in the morning because no one can figure out how the stuff works and then it's broken. So your telemetry gets better, your monitoring gets better, your quality gets better. Uh, you just get in that habit of thinking about that all the time. So changing job market too. So my premise was that the way the architectures are being built today, right? The change to a small cross-functional team from what used to be a 25, 50 person team, uh, the DevOps methodology, and of course this need for speed. We need to go fast. And one of the biggest inhibitors to speed are people. You put people in a process, you put a handoff in a process, it's going to slow it down. So if you want to get as fast as you can, you need to think about how do I make it have less handoffs. So the effect of this is, is changing the way I think about hiring engineers. So I moved from uh, an individual contributor to an engineering manager at Veracode. And actually, is there any cu uh, customers Veracode in the room? Ooh, a room full of prospects. I love it. OK. <laughs> awesome. And the fact that developers need to know a hell of a lot more today than they did even a year ago. So as you think about and, and walk through this with me, think about all the things that you now need to learn that were other people's jobs two years ago. 
and what does that mean for their jobs moving forward? So who do we have in the audience as a developer? Most people? All right, all right, hold on. So this happens to me all the time. I ask a question, and I get a couple of arms, and then maybe something like this. Can everyone just raise one arm, like really high? I just want to make sure your arms are working. Come on now, I, I'm not moving on until we go. Please, help me out here. All right, who in the room is a developer? All right, who in the room is quality? A couple, security, anybody? Oh, awesome, my brothers. Operations, excellent, excellent. All right, so who thinks it's their job to do security? Uh, see, all your hands should have gone up. It's everybody's job. All right, so these cross-functional teams need to have accountability for what they do. So otherwise, that DevOps model that I put up before doesn't work. So let's talk about architectures. You know, whether it's a web browser or a, an application, a thick client type of thing, you have these end-tier architectures. That's what I grew up doing, and right? that's what I cut my teeth on. Now, the problem with this is we started to create these specializations, right? Who was a front-end developer? and middleware, and I only do business logic. It's like, what the hell does that mean? I only do database. It's like, well, okay, great, good for you. Now, in those big, long projects, that was okay to have when I've got a team of 50 people and I can have a couple of DBAs and a, and a bunch of people that only do middleware. But that doesn't work as we're trying to build this software really quickly, right? So we moved from this monolithic end-tier architecture into this microservices where all these things are communicating to each other and they all have embedded UI inside of them. So I've got a SPA sitting inside of my microservice that when it's time to go and do a configuration, up it comes, right? Who do you think writes that? Is it a UI guy? I don't think so. I don't have time and I don't have the space on my teams to have people that just do UI. If we look at web technology, so back when I started, you click on a link and it goes to the server and it come, fetches a whole new HTML page back and repaints the whole screen. It was really ugly. Uh, you know, we moved to that Ajax model and now we're into REST, right? So if you look at Amazon.com, it's one web application, but how many microservices are sitting behind that? How many microservices are actually serving UI into that portal, right? We don't have these portlets anymore. Got a bunch of microservices, and they all say, here's my UI. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. Everything else keeps ticking along. If one service is down, the rest of the experience still works. So this is what we used to hire, or this is what we hire today. This is kind of the state of the art. I want to have a full stack developer. Right? So I talk about technology. I talk about, hey, do you know, know how to do Angular? Are you really proficient in JavaScript? Can you do Node? Can you do all of those things? Can you go soup to nuts from front end to back end? That's the way we used to think about developers. But actually, we're all pretty smart. And one of the things that happened to me in my career when I came to Veracode, I had done some Java programming, but I'd never shipped anything doing Java. It's hard to get a job in those days to say, yeah, I'm, I'm really proficient in .NET and C++. I can do this Java thing. I'm a smart guy. I can do this. And it was hard to get that, that first job. In fact, I, I went to interview at a company. I was an expert in, in uh, storage. And I had done it in ASP, that, that first job. They said, well, we can't hire you because you don't know Java. I'm like, how long is it going to take you to build an expert in the storage space? So you're going to go hire someone that knows Java and then try to learn the space? That's stupid. It's backwards. So let's talk about methodologies and team sizes now. So here is our waterfall, right? Long time, maybe a year, maybe once a year, maybe four times a year we're releasing our software. Now one of the things that I, I t often talk to security professionals and people that are non-technical about, about the difference between waterfall and agile and DevOps. It's like if you look at what happens with agile, it's not, the, it's not different. I still have requirements, I still have to code it, I still have to test it, I still have to release it. All of those waterfally type steps still occur. They just all happen with me, right? Smaller chunks, less risk. It's just trimming it down. I'm not doing a one year horizon and trying to schedule that. I'm actually saying, let's just do a couple of small things, let's commit to it as a team and let's go, right? So that's agile. And at DevOps, it's exactly the same thing. I'm taking the even smaller piece. Maybe I'm doing single piece flow like we talked about before. One developer's work goes right out to production. And when you're doing it at scale, it looks like this, right? It could be happening anywhere and everywhere. 
If we look at the team sizes now, again, who, who's done waterfall? I, I can say it proud, I, I'm good with that. 50 person team, full of specialists, full of handoffs. Uh, again, one to four releases a year. Now you get to Agile, and now we're talking a couple times a month and we've trimmed the team down, six to 12 people, but we're still building applications. So what does that mean for all these specialists? What are we gonna do with knowledge that used to be in 50 people's heads, I need it in six to 12 people's heads? We need to become more cross-functional. This is what happened with Agile, right? We started to think about, hey, this test-driven development looks pretty cool because I can't claim I'm done until it's tested. So we started to get serious about writing unit tests. There was, people were talking about unit tests forever. But when you get to Agile and you're like, you know what? You don't get any credit for your velocity unless it's tested and functional and ready to go. I need a shippable unit by the end of that sprint. It's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna change the way I think. And of course, the other thing that people don't understand typically is that DevOps and Agile, it, you usually run DevOps on top of Agile, whether it's Kanban or Agile Scrum or Scrumban or something like that. It's some flavor of that. I've seen people saying, well, you know, I've got these waterfall teams and one of them's going to Agile and one of them's going to DevOps. I scratch my head, I'm like, I don't think that word means what you think it means. Uh, they, they don't understand that all of the lessons that you need to learn, you learn when you do your Agile transformation. All of the pain that you have to go through to do all the automated testing that you never did when you were doing waterfall, you do in your Agile transformation. You have to build up that muscle to say, automate, automate, automate. Now you don't go as far as DevOps, but that's where you make those learnings. And then after that, it's just like more, more, more. So the way we ship software today, and it, this is, we're kind of on the cusp, this is really changing uh, the, the way things are done, but typically in a, in a physical environment for a company, if I've got a physical infrastructure, developer's gonna build the software, then I'm gonna have quality guy come in and tell me whether it's good or not, right? We're gonna have the security guys validate it. Now, of course, they do that at the end, and as I can talk to you all day about how AppSec can be done a lot better. In fact, that's my Ignite today. Management does approvals. Boy, this is gets in the way, right? Again, more people, emails with, uh, with rubber stamps that come back, say, hey, I'd like to change, approved. Like, whoa, how'd that happen? It's like, do they even look at the change request? Again, we, we talked about this this morning with the Iron Age, talking about racking and stacking, cabling up hardware, and then I gotta have someone come in and install operating systems on it and get, build it up into something that I can actually use. Uh, add all the supporting software, so am I running on Tomcat, am I running on JBoss? And then the ops guys, they're the ones that keep it all humming, right? So this was my, uh, this was the thing that I saw in the industry, this pivot, kind of taking that tower of full stack and laying it on its side. Thinking about what we actually do now. An individual builds the software, they test it, they're responsible for testing. Now sometimes they're gonna have help from, from people that are uh, more astute in quality, uh, but they're gonna do it themselves. And then they're gonna validate their security, so this whole shift left movement in application security, I'm responsible for that as well. I've got a pipeline now that does uh, releases of software. It's not a, a scripting anymore, it's not a person, it's software. The, uh, the software terraforms the environment. I don't even need hardware anymore. I can build it out of nothing. I can build it in the cloud. And then we configure and install it, whether that be containers or something else. We, we set something up to run the software for us. I do not need to have a person go into a closet and do some magic. And then I have the, the pipeline that actually delivers it into production. So I don't see a lot of different things going on here from an individual basis. Now, the team monitors it and manages it. So this is the DevOps thing, right? I drive behavior by making you responsible for running what you write. So that's where I came to this conclusion that this, we're really talking not about multi-technology, but multi-discipline. It's not, I, you know what, that languages are gonna change. We're gonna go to Golang, we're gonna do this, we're gonna try that. We had Node and you know, it'll be something different tomorrow. There'll always be some new technology that you need to go and learn and some new framework. You know, it struts yesterday and it'll be something else tomorrow. You're gonna have to go and learn that. But this part is not really going to change. All of these aspects of software creation are the same. And we're being asked to do them now. So it starts with being a great engineer. 
right? I have to be a good developer. Uh, I have to understand open source. I have to understand and stay on top of standards. Next step, again, this was part of our agile transformation. I have to understand quality. I have to build stuff that functions. Now, whether I do TDD or I do unit tests or I do something else, I need to understand the quality of the software that I write. Now, this is the, the really crazy one. This used to be systems engineering and IT. If I'm doing containers now, I'm picking the operating system. I'm picking what's running on top of the operating system. I, that is actually my deployment is not an application anymore. It's the whole thing. It's the, it's the machine and all into some virtual environment. So think of all the things that you never had to think about. What version of the operating system are you going to run on? Which versions of open source do you have installed in there? Do you have a bill of materials for that? So you know, uh, another talk I do on, on open source, just to give you a little scare factor, who knows whether or not they, they uh, ship with struts. Just, you know it or not, right? Everyone knows whether or not they ship with struts. But what if I asked the room, who ships with Apache Commons Collection 3.2.1? Does anyone in here know? Now, I know. But if you don't know, this is what we as developers really do poorly. We kind of we integrate it, and then we abandon it. So this has got to change. So how are you going to operate the thing? You need to build in telemetry. You need to build in monitoring. This was the job of the operations people. Now, we're going to have operations people on our team or people that are more inclined to do that. But if I want someone to write a piece of code and get it quickly to production, I don't need to have 28 handoffs. They don't have to do like the brute force of, of setting it up, but adding to it as we go. Security, huge topic for me. Love it to death. Um, it needs to be part of your definition of done. If it's not, you should ask why. Uh, we need to be educated on it because as developers, I don't think anyone in the room graduated with a secure coding degree. I didn't. <laughs> uh, and this is, again, this is one of the things that we keep learning in the industry. When we did uh, the agile transformation, it was like, geez, we can fix things quicker and faster if we shift all the quality left into the team. It's the same thing with security. Security is quality. So by testing it earlier, we're actually finding and fixing it and able to move faster. All right, so what do we do about our specialists? We've got all these people. We've got DBAs. I've got people that are experts in operations. Uh, I've got people that are experts in, in architecture. So what I want you to do is think about it as guilds, uh, practices inside of your company that are led by those people. Let them help point the direction, right? We want them to communicate best practices and teach. Hold birds of a feather meeting so you guys can learn from one another. Like I said, not, you can't be an expert in everything, but as software engineers, don't you know a little about everything? So we're asking to ramp that up just a little bit more. Because what I'm looking to hire is someone that can say, hey, I know how to you know, change the pipeline. I know how to add stuff into the container. I know how to do all of those things. Uh, maybe I can't do it with a white sheet of paper, but I can certainly work with what we have. All right, so in conclusion, the way software is being written has fundamentally changed. We don't build software the same. We don't test it the same. We don't deploy it the same anymore. The physical infrastructure is going away. If it hasn't for you, it will. We're moving to the cloud, and that means somebody else's computers, but we're actually deploying a different kind of artifact. We're not deploying a war file anymore. We're deploying a, a container image that has our application inside of it. With team sizes shrinking, we have to become cross-functional in nature, right? So I can't have a quality person. All I do is write tests. Well, that's good, but I really don't need you here. I need you to do more. I need you to take on other job responsibilities. Uh, the velocity expectations are not going to go down. Who thinks that you know, the company tomorrow is going to be like, oh, you know, that's fast enough. Don't worry about it. We're good. We're, we're making enough money right now. Uh, so th this is another uh, thing that I've been talking about a lot lately, accountability. Um, I've heard people use it the wrong way, which is I'm going to hold you accountable. But what we want is for us as, uh, as developers and quality and et cetera this, to take accountability. I want to be accountable for the product of my work. I take a lot of pride in what I write. I take pride that when I check it in, my buddy in the next cube is going to be like, whoa, did you see that? That's awesome. That's what we like to hear. That's what floats our boat. 
So this is the next level of that. So to do that, we need to think about those multiple disciplines and not just blindly go and say, hey, I'm gonna just pick this container uh, from Docker and say, that's my image. What's in that image? What are you actually installing? What are you running on? Because the risks that arise because of that, everyone heard of the Equifax breach? Yeah? Open source. It's not that open source is bad, we just don't, we don't actually keep track of it. We're like, eh, struts, I'm done. And then struts vulnerability comes out and no one knows where it is, no one knows how to patch it, we don't have a, a MTTR that's any good around this. So we have to build out those practices, we have to understand those various aspects and how they affect us as, as engineers. Thank you.